So I'm Crystal Egley. I'm a videographer for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I have been moderating these these last few weeks. So I just want to thank you for showing up again uh, on week five. And today we're going to talk about the secondary draw, which is brand new. Do I know what it is? No, but hopefully one of these other people around here can tell us. Um, and I can chime in with polls every now and then. All right. So for those of you who have been here before, I would just like to review that we have turned off the chat box for attendees. If you have any questions, you can put it in the Q&A box at, down at the bottom. And one of the great things about that is when we answer the questions, um, nobody can see them until we answer them. So once we answer them, you can actually keep track and see what other people have been asking uh, as well. So perhaps somebody is going to ask the question you might have asked or already did and you missed it. So we're just writing those answers um, out. And uh, if, it, if we think it's broad enough for everybody, we'll talk it out loud. But just keep an eye on that Q&A box because we're going to be answering a lot of questions you might not even have known you had. Um, and I think that's about it for housekeeping stuff. Did I miss anything this time, Brian? I think you have it. Um, we are recording it, so. All right, we are recording these. So if you need a refresher, especially on this one, because we dig deep here, <laughs> and some of this is a little confusing. We are recording this, and we'll try to get it up as fast as we can on YouTube. Um, and I will send a link in the chat box to all the attendees about where you can find these recordings. All right, let's start with introductions. I already did that and poured my heart out. So Brian, let's start with you, your job, and um, what you're like, just a general overview of today. Yes, uh, my name is Brian Postumas. I'm the statewide hunter outreach coordinator. I'm out of the Denver office on 6060 Broadway. Today, we are going to talk about the secondary draw. This is our fifth um, webinar in a series we've gone gone through topic by topic trying to help hunters, whether you're a new hunter, you're new to Colorado, or you're a hunter that, that's been hunting for a long time, but you just have questions. We're, we're trying to provide some good customer service, trying to provide some answers. Um, we'd like to encourage you to get out hunting. Um, we, we rely on you as hunters to manage wildlife. So thank you so much for, for doing it. And thank you to all the panelists that are joining us today. So thank you so much for your time. All right, next. All right, next, I'm going to put Lisa on the spot. Lisa, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Lisa Thompson, and I am a professional hunter sponsored by Cabela's and Bass Pro. I've been hunting a long time. I'm from the big sky state of Montana, live in Colorado now, and um, just I, I love what we're doing here, and if there's anything that... Um, I can share with anyone out there on the hunting or the outdoors. I'm, I'm just grateful that you're here with us tonight and hopefully we all can learn something. So thank you for being with us. All right, Courtney, I'm going to unmute you. My dog is really loud, dude. Um, Courtney, uh, hello. And Justin is also there. And Justin has a special guest. Oh yeah. Uh, Hi everyone. The puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Courtney Nicholson. Uh, I am a volunteer hunter education instructor with the CPW. Um, I work in the hunting and fishing industry doing marketing and video work like Crystal does. And um, I'm just really passionate, of, passionate about bringing uh, new hunters into the fold, um, particularly women. So it's kind of my passion. Justin? And I'm Justin Bubinick. I'll be in the background tonight for the most part, but I'm also a volunteer CPW uh, Hunter Ed instructor and super excited to get more involved with that. I'm a recent migrant to uh, Colorado and absolutely loving it so far. Excited to have my first season of big game hunting in Colorado this year. And this is Rogue. She is a small Munsterlander and she is absolutely amazing and gets way too much love than she deserves, but. No such thing. I think <laughs> we're soon to be the star of this uh, show here. Um, Logan, hello again. Hello, I'm Logan Wilkins. I'm the district wildlife manager out in Lincoln County um, along the Eastern Plains of Colorado. 
near Lyman and cover a lot of this area out here. Um, I am a Colorado native. I grew up in Yuma, Colorado and have spent my entire life hunting and fishing. And I also direct the uh, rookie sports person program that's run out of area 14 in Colorado Springs. Excellent. I am going to unmute Tracy Predmore. Tracy, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're still on mute. Hold on one second. Oh, okay. Got it. There you uh, go. I'm Tracy Predmore. I'm the education coordinator in the Southeast region and work closely with Logan and a lot of our great staff to help with the hunter outreach efforts that we have in this part of the state. And I'm very excited to be here tonight and answer some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Danielle. How about you? You're a new face here. What do you do? Thanks. Yeah, my name is Danielle Eisenhart. I'm the licensed Pass and Reservation Section Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I've been with the agency for close to 15 years. Started off like Logan as a District Wildlife Manager and then was the Reg Manager as well for CPW for five years and pretty much been almost a year in this current position as Licensed Pass and Reservation Section Manager. So thanks for inviting me for tonight's secondary draw discussion. Thank you for coming. We know today was a busy day for you. So uh, next we have Jennifer. Jennifer is a new face here too. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks Crystal. I'm Jennifer Stanley. I'm the education coordinator in our Northeast region uh, based out of the Denver office and I work a lot with Brian uh, to help coordinate and run um, clinics and ladies night out and particularly archery. So I'm excited to be here and uh, to help answer questions tonight. Thanks. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Andre. Hi, I'm Andre. I work in the Hunter Education Department for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, if you look at Brian's video, he's got a brick wall right next to him. I, my office is on the other side of that brick wall. So I'm also out of the Denver office right next to Brian. Um, and uh, yeah, that's me. Oh, and that crystal lady is my wife. All right, I am going to turn it over to Brian now to get us started and um, do an intro on today. All right, so we're going to get started here talking about the secondary draw. The secondary draw doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you understand the primary draw. So we're going to um, get into a little bit of information about the primary draw and kind of work through it. We also don't want to just stop with a secondary draw. We want to get licenses into your hands. So we're going to also talk a little bit about over-the-counter options, some of the, the leftovers, reissue opportunities as well. So that's kind of our topic for tonight. If you're wondering about hunt statistics, if you're wondering about virtual scouting, field scouting, hunting tactics, check out our, our YouTube um, channel for CPW because we've already done those webinars. So if you haven't seen them, you can check those out and learn those um, tomorrow. So, all right, I think we're going to get going um, and talk about the draw. Um, actually, before we do that, can we do the poll, the first poll question, Crystal? Yep. So you all know how much I love polls, everyone. So we want to know, do you have a big game hunting partner or honey buddies that you go with? Hmm. Oh, that's actually really interesting. I cannot wait to share these results with you. Um, all right, so it's looking like Got about 78% in. Coming up next, the first section is going to be by Andre, by the way. So, Andre, get ready. All right, I'm gonna end this poll and I'm gonna share the results. I am actually very interested that 22% uh, are solo hunters. That's very cool. All right, Andre, please bring us into topic number one. All right, um, I don't know if anybody mentioned it. I think we skipped over it again. Uh, if you have questions, as we go along at the very bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A option. Click that and type in your answers there and we'll be answering them as we go. I don't know if we got to that or not. Um, so let me share my screen with everybody here. All right, can you see that Crystal? I had to turn my volume off because we're in the same house. <laughs> No worries, just want to make sure everybody sees this. So we're talking, yeah, we're talking about the secondary draw, but uh, to know how that works, we need to know how the other primary or first draw 
works. So it's their limited license draws. They can be a little complicated to understand, especially for new people. So I'm gonna try to explain this as best as I can and keep it as short as I can so that you all don't get bored with all this information. There's gonna be a lot coming your way. So stick with me. All right, so limited license draw. So the first one, uh, what we call the primary draw or the first draw is always in April. Uh, it's usually the very first week of April. The date moves around depending on the calendar, but that's the deadline. That's the, one of your last days to get in your application for the first draw. And the licenses that are available are put up in early March or late February, as soon as we can get them up. And it's, this is the, there's many different ways to get licenses and we'll go through pretty much every single way to get a license tonight. But the primary draw is your very first chance to get a license uh, for the following hunting year. So this is your first chance to get in there and see uh, what's available and get out. And all of these are listed in our brochures. So if you're wondering where can I find all the licenses that are available, they're in our brochures. The brochures are online digitally at C our CPW website. They're also available at uh, any licensed retailer. So if you go into a Walmart, a Bass Pro Shop, a Cabela's, uh, your local bait and fly shop, uh, they will have these brochures in there for you. So you can pick up a hard copy if you don't like uh, going the digital way. And you can also request that a paper copy be sent to you through the mail on our website as well. So. We call these limited license draws because there's a limited a set quota uh, of licenses available. Each hunt code, there's a certain number of licenses that are allocated to it and available to the public. So that quota can vary uh, depending on where it is in the state. And we manage our herd differently in different parts of the state. Uh, when there's a robust population, naturally we can uh, allocate more licenses. And when the population is smaller, we allocate fewer licenses. And we're not just picking these numbers out of a hat. We're not just saying, oh, 10, whatever. Uh, we have biologists all over the state. They do extensive studies. They do counts of the herd uh, populations to make sure that the herd can sustain the number of licenses that we're allocating per area. Um, but like I said, there's a set limit. That's why it's called limited license. So when all those licenses are gone for a certain code, they're gone. There's no more available. We'll talk about our unlimited licenses later, but right now we're only talking about the limited ones with a set quota. Um, so we have 10 big game species in Colorado. There's only one that's not, uh, the licenses aren't allocated through the draw process and that's mountain lions. So if you're interested about mountain lions, that's a topic for another day. But nine of our other 10 big game species are all through the draw. So that includes elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, pronghorn, black bear, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, desert bighorn sheep, mountain goat, and moose. They're all in the draw. So how do you enter the draw? Uh, so you have to meet some qualifications first. You have to have hunter education. Unless you were born before 1949, that makes you age exempt. Uh, but if you don't have hunter education, you can't enter the draw. Uh, you also need to be at least 12 years old to hunt big game. Uh, however, you can be 11, if, but if, if you turn 12 before the season you're gonna hunt starts, you can apply as an 11 year old. So if your birthday's in July or something like that and the season you wanna hunt's in September, you can apply as an 11 year old because you're gonna be old enough to hunt big game when the season starts. Uh, and you're also gonna need a qualifying license. Now, qualifying licenses include our annual small game license, our annual small game and fishing combo license, and our spring turkey license. We also have lifetime uh, combo fishing and small game licenses and uh, lifetime small game licenses that are allocated uh, sometimes to uh, veterans and things like that. Those also count as qualifying licenses. So, it's all about hunt codes. When you enter the draw, what you're basically typing into our system to enter the draw is a hunt code. So if you open up any of our brochures, our big game brochures and turn towards the back, you're gonna see pages and pages of these hunt codes. And it's, it can be very daunting, very confusing to look at uh, the first time. Uh, this is just a ra random page I pulled up of deer 
hunt codes and you can see there's a lot going on here and I'm going to try to break this down as best I can so that people can understand what all these different categories mean. Units, valid, unit, state, sex, hunt code, list, etc. So the most important thing is the hunt code. That's the part that's so you know you're getting the license you want, but you need to know what it means. So we're going to break that down for you. This is just a hunt code I picked randomly. Uh, DM 03002R. What does that mean? Let's break it down. So we're going to start from the left and just break down what this all means. The D is your species identifier. In this case, the D stands for deer. So this is a deer tag. Um, the other identifiers you're going to see in our brochures are E for elk, M for moose, A for pronghorn, B for black bear, S for Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, G for mountain goat, and C for desert bighorn. I don't know why it's C, but that's what it is. Next one up, M, uh, for this hunt code. This is your sex identifier. So in this case, M is male or buck because it's a deer. So you can only harvest an antlered deer with this, uh, if you have a license with this hunt code on it. The other qualifiers you'll see in this category are F for female or doe. And that would also cover antler lists. So if you did harvest a male animal, but it didn't have antlers, that would still fall under the F. And then E for either sex, that basically opens up the field to you. If you have a hunt code or license with a hunt code that's either sex, you can harvest a male or a female, it doesn't matter. Next one up, this, is, uh, this stands for the GMU or game management unit that you can hunt. In this case, it's 030, so that's unit 30. If you've never heard the term GMU before, our state is broken up into game management units or GMUs. This is a map of the state. So all of these little sections have a number of licenses allocated to them. And this is your map so you know where that place is. If you're looking through all those codes and you see, you know, where is unit 30? Um, it's out just north of Grand Junction. And I'll, I'll show you where that is in just a section. So this is the hunt code we're talking about right here, uh, DM03002R. Uh, and this is the column for valid units. So this tag that we're talking about is only valid in unit 30, which is over here by Grand Junction. So you can only use that tag here. Now, if you're in our big game brochure, you'll see that there's other caveats to this. So I just pulled up a random option here. This is unit 12. And if you'll see in the valid unit box here, there's several GMUs listed. So this tag right here, even though it just says 012, is actually valid in five different units. They're located right here. So that tag is actually good in 12, 24, 25, 26, and 231 in the flat top wilderness right here. You can hunt all that area. Um, but when we write out the hunt codes, we use the slowest number GMU. So that's why that pops up as 012, even though it's good in all of those units. Down here, 11 is the lowest, so that's why it pops up as 011 for the GMU. Moving on, so the next uh, number sequence, the O2, this is your season identifier. So in this case, 02 is your second season. Uh, the other things you might see pop up as identifiers here, there's quite a few. 01 is first season, 03 is third season, 04 is fourth season. If you see an E, that's early season. See an L1, that's late season. Uh, if you see a K2 or a K3, that's youth only. If you're an adult, you can't have that license it's for youth only. Um, you'll see a lot of P's out there, P1, P2, P3, P4. Those are private land only tags. You can't use them on public land. So if you're going for a license that's private land only, make sure you have access to land in that area before you go for that license. You don't want to end up with a tag that you can't legally use. Uh, and the very last one that you might see, a W or J, uh, those are ranching for wildlife tags. Uh, they're, there's not that many of them, but they do exist. Basically, there's landowners in the state uh, with large swaths of land that have opened that land up to the public to hunt. 
and we have a limited number of licenses available for people to go and hunt that private land uh, and it's part of what we call ranching for wildlife. So if you see a W or a J, that's what that means. And last one R, this um, is your method of take, we like to say. Uh, I know licensing, sometimes they don't like to say R is rifle, but it's, it's the easiest way for me to remember it. I apologize, Daniel, uh, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm making your eyes twitch or something by saying that, but uh, that's your, kind of your method of take uh, category. The other things you'll see here is A for archery, M for muzzleloader, and this is a new one, X for season choice. Uh, these are really cool tags. There's not a bunch of them, but they are really cool. Uh, basically, it's a tag that moves season to season until you fill it. Yeah, you start off in archery season, hunting archery, and if you don't fill that tag, it becomes a muzzleloader uh, tag when the muzzleloader season starts. You can hunt muzzleloader until the muzzleloader season ends. If you still haven't filled that tag, it becomes a rifle season tag and you keeps going season to season until you fill it. Um, so that's a really cool license. Uh, so that's what an X means if you ever see that. So going back to that first page I showed you, hopefully this makes slightly more sense to you now. I know I went through it a little quick. I could spend hours and hours diving into this, but um, you have your units, your valid units where you can use it, the dates, that's great. So you know what second season is, what the actual dates are for that. The only thing I haven't mentioned here yet is list. And there were some questions already when we started talking about list. So let me try to clear that up. There's three different types of licenses that we have, list A, B, and C. And this determines how many, uh, the number of licenses you can have. And they follow this rule. So you can have only one A license. You can't have more than one A license. And when you enter the draw, you can only draw one license per species. So if you enter the primary draw in April, you can only get one deer tag out of it. You can only get one elk tag out of it. You can get a bunch of tags, but only one for each species. So if you drew an A tag in, your, in the very first draw, and you're like, I want another license, when the secondary draw comes around, you can go for a B license or a C license because you can have uh, one A and one B, or you can have two Bs, uh, and the Cs are kind of never ending. You can keep tacking those on as long as you're willing to pay for another license. Um, so here you can see we only one A, or you can go A and B, or B and B if you want to have two. If you want to have more than two, you can only add C's to get above two licenses. Um, so that's what the list is. Um, that's kind of a very brief overview of that, but that's essentially what that is. And uh, we can double back if there's additional questions relating to that. So when you apply, you get choices. You get to put in four choices for hunt code that you want to try and draw. But like I said, you can only get one of those licenses. You, once you draw a tag, it doesn't matter how many other choices you had listed, we just stop with you. We don't pull more than one tag per person, per species, sorry. Uh, and when you go in to apply, you go, you do this online at cpwshop.com. Uh, it's all online, digital now. And you'll select the animal or the species you wanna hunt, be it uh, deer or elk or bear, and that first, uh, sec or uh, sorry, species identifier were autofill. The only uh, draw we have open right now is turkey. So that's why I screen grabbed this. Uh, so ignore this, that it's turkey. That's just the only screen grab I could grab for this presentation. Um, so imagine we went in and we selected deer. This would autofill to D for deer. And then this is the code we've been talking about, M03002R. We put that in as our first choice. And when the draw process goes, your first choice is the one you want the most, second choice, and so on down the line. And don't feel you have to fill out all four of these. If you only have one code that you want, only put in one. If you have a first choice and a fallback, put in those two. You don't have to put in every single code. Some people will fill this out and get their fourth choices, which is something they don't even want. Um, so only put in codes you really want. And you'll see down here at the bottom, there's often a option for if you don't get any of these options, you can select that I would just rather have nothing, or sometimes you can add on an over-the-counter tag. Um, 
And we'll talk about over the counter later, but that can be like an automatic. If you don't get anything in the draw, you get an over the counter tag. So yes, preference points. Everybody's favorite topic, uh, preference points essentially move you to the front of the line in our first draw. The preference points do not apply at all to the secondary draw. It's only that first primary draw. So how to, <laughs> how to explain preference points? Uh, like I said, they move you to the front of the line. The more preference points you have, the better chance you have of drawing the tag that you want. Now, uh, preference points only really deal with their very first choice when you're entering the draw. If you put in a hunt code like we just did in that example, and we didn't get that hunt code, we didn't draw that first choice tag, we get a preference point as kind of a consolation for not getting that. Um, and like I said, the preference points move you up in line. So the more preference points you get, the better your chances. So we didn't get it this year, we get a preference point, we have a better chance of getting that tag the following year. Uh, however, you can also put in just for a preference point. And there's a special code you can put in. Uh, people sometimes do this if they know they won't be able to hunt that year. Uh, maybe you've planned a vacation during the season, you usually hunt and you won't be able to hunt, but you still wanna get a point for that season. You can put in just for a preference point. And this has to be your first choice when you put in for the preference point. Uh, and this is what the codes look like if you're just going for a preference point. It's D uh, for deer, P, 99999P, and then elk, E. It's, so the code is the same, the P, 99999P. It's just the species identifier that changes as you're uh, putting it for preference points. And you can only get one preference point uh, per year uh, in the primary draw. Uh, so moving on. So every year you enter the draw, if you're putting in four preference point or if you're putting in a code, you're gonna get a point if you don't draw your first choice. If your first choice is a preference point, naturally you're gonna get a preference point. That's all it is. If you're putting in for something else and you don't get it, the consolation prize is getting a preference point. And you continuously will get preference points until you draw that first choice tag. You're basically moving yourself up in the line every single time you get a preference point. But once you draw that first choice preference or that first choice tag, your preference points have gotten you far enough up the list that you are now drawing the tag you want. So you lose the preference points. They go back to zero. They helped you get that tag and you use them to get that tag. That's why they go back to zero. So the, if you draw a first choice tag, your preference points are zero. So if you start with zero and you draw your first choice, you're at zero. If you had 30 and you draw your first choice, you're back to zero. Um, but you did get the tag you wanted. So that's what the preference points do. They give you a better chance. And a lot of people will ask, can I lose my preference points? Will they just vanish uh, overnight if I don't enter the draw? They can, but it takes a while. Uh, if you don't purchase, say you have 10 deer points, and you don't purchase a deer license and you don't enter the draw for deer for 10 consecutive years, you will lose those points. Uh, but it has to be 10 consecutive years of you not putting in for the draw, not going hunting for a species before you lose them. So it can happen, but it will take a while. A lot of people do ask that question, so I wanted to lay that out here really quick. Um, so let's just do a quick example with using that hunt code that we've been using to show you kind of how uh, we go through with these preference points and how that uh, system works, uh, getting people to the front of the line. Uh, in the very the second um, webinar that we did, Brian went over uh, statistics, and they're available on our website, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website. So you can pull up big game statistics, and this is uh, a report of how things drew out uh, in 2019. So how many points it took to draw this hunt code, the hunt code we've been talking about. So DM03002R. So in 2019, there were 100 of these licenses available. So we had 100 people or 100 licenses to give out. And as you see, we had well over 100 people apply. So not everybody's gonna get the license that they're going in for. 
uh, but as you see here, the preference points has, this is kind of a, a weighted list. So the most preference points anybody who applied for that tag had was nine. And there's these two non-resident people. So they had the most preference points. They are at the front of the line. They got their tags. So now we have 98 left and nobody with eight points applied, but one person with seven points applied. So now we have 97 licenses left and we go down the list. Uh, here we have three and then we have a couple more here, six, and then we have 23 applying here. And as you see, we get down and we started with a hundred and we get down here um, to two points. There's 58 people applying here. And at this point, we had 65 licenses left. So all of these people got their license uh, with two preference points. But that left this group right here. There's 63 people here that applied with their first choice with one preference point. Everybody here is at the same level. They all put it as their first choice. They all have one preference point, but there's only seven licenses left to be distributed amongst 63 people. This is when our, license, our system becomes totally uh, automated and random. Uh, everybody's application is randomized and we draw seven lucky people out of this group of 63 to get those last seven licenses. The people who didn't get those last seven licenses get a preference point. And uh, all these people who had zero preference points and applied, it never even got to them. They didn't have a chance. Uh, so if you see uh, of any kind of documentation that says this hunt code DM03002R drew out at one preference point. That means the very last person to get this tag had one preference point. That was the that was the bare minimum to get in. If you had zero preference points, you never even had a chance. And saying it drew at one point doesn't mean that everybody with one point got it. As you can see, there were 63 people here and only seven people got it. So that's kind of how the preference points uh, show in a uh, hierarchy. The more preference points you have, the closer to the top of the list you are and the better your chances of getting the license you want are. Um, and anything, sometimes there's tags like this that go um, to the point where we have a whole bunch left even after we get to all the people with zero preference points. Then we go to this, our second choice, people who had this as their second choice but didn't draw their first choice. If we go through that and there's still licenses left, we go to the third choice and fourth choice. And if there's still licenses left for a hunt code after that, they're left over and they will go to the second draw. Uh, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, but before we get there, I wanted to let uh, talk about one more thing that keeps coming up in these webinars, which is group hunts. So you can apply as a group, but you uh, say you have three people, you all want to hunt together, you all want to have the same license, and you put in as a group, you all have to be going for the exact same hunt code. So say you're all putting in for DM03002R, all three of you. And say one of you is this guy with nine points, and one of you is this person with five, and one of you is this person with two. When you're in a group, everybody has to draw or nobody draws. And when you go in as a group, you are weighted with whoever has the fewest preference points. So it doesn't matter that one of you has nine and one of you has five, you're all going in with two. You're based on this person. If they don't get it, none of you get it. Um, so that's kind of how a group hunt works. Just really quick, because uh, people keep asking that question. I hope that kind of cleared that up a little bit. Um, but that's essentially the primary draw. And that was a very, very quick. We can dive into that and spend hours on it. But that's the primary draw. So feel free to fill in any gaps that I missed, Danielle. Um, but uh, that's the gist. Nice job, Andre. All right. Um, Danielle, anything? Nope. Nice job, Andre. You covered it very well. Oops. Hold on. On mute. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. Sorry about that, Danielle. I was just going to say, very nice job, Andre. I think you did a great job. 
Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Okay. I thought I could have used some work, but I mean, you're in licensing. So I guess, I guess we'll go with that. All right. So next we're going to have, oh, uh, are we doing a poll right now? Um, I think we are. Let's see. Poll question number two before Logan talks about the secondary draw rules. So poll question number two is... How many people, for those of you who hunt, um, oh, actually, that's one of the options. Looking, how many people do you usually hunt big game with? This is big game. Obviously, with pheasant hunts, you might go with, with more. So are you looking for something to go hunting with? Are you a solo hunter? You're like, I'm not looking for any friends. Um, one, two to four, or five or more. And while we're waiting for that, I'm going to tell you a hunting joke. OK, you ready? Two hunters in deer camp woke up in the middle of the night. Look at the stars, what a splendor, said one of the hunters. Yeah, said the other one. But what do you think happened to our tent? All right, I can't hear you all laughing, so I'm just gonna assume you are. Um, all right, let's share those results. How many people do usually go big game hunting with? A lot of you are looking for somebody to go hunting with, so next week's webinar will be a really great one for you. We're gonna be talking about mentorship and hunting groups like Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and where you can find um, that mentorship support or just another friend or, or person to go with, you know? Um, solo hunters, hardcore. I'm gonna go on my first solo deer hunt this, this fall and um, yeah, it looks like a lot of you, most of you hunt with, with somebody else, so cool. All right, moving on to Logan. You're up. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here real quick. All right, so I'm gonna start off, so we're gonna be at the, showing my screen at the homepage for our website. Um, and if you just right now for the secondary draw, um, which uh, applications are being accepted tomorrow, um, just flip through here, right here on the home page. This will be up for a while. Um, you'll just click on this tab right here, and it'll bring you to the secondary draw link. Um, you can also get there by going to um, do, do things to do and go to hunting licenses, and then there will be a link through there as well. Um, but a couple of things, um, just going through this page to kind of show you. Um, so this is going to replace what we used to have as the leftover draw. Um, the leftover draw was only available to folks that applied in the primary draw and then did not receive a tag in their first, second, third, or fourth choice. And if they didn't receive a tag in any of those choices, they had the option to opt in or opt out of the leftover draw. And um, those tags that were available was anything that didn't get picked up in the primary draw. So this year, starting this year, we are making that available to anybody and everybody to apply for that, those tags. Um, this is gonna create a lot more opportunity um, for people who either missed the draw, uh, for people who were in the primary draw to maybe pick up a second tag for a species if it's a list B or a list C, um, and also make those tags a lot more available um, before the leftover um, period happens and the leftover sale, um, which I would anticipate that the number of tags that are available on leftover day um, get decreased dramatically because of this secondary draw being open to everybody. Um, so a couple of things about this draw, um, just to kind of go through here, uh, it will require um, a qualifying license. Uh, there will, uh, there's still going to be an application fee of seven dollars for residents, nine dollars for non-residents. Um, the, the purpose for those, uh, that those fees of $7 and $9 is to help cover the cost, um, of processing your application. So, um, we as an agency, um, hire a company that, uh, to run, um, the licensing system that we use. Um, there's only a couple of those companies in the continental United States that actually does that. Um, and so that's what most states are using and they charge us for every application that comes through. Uh, and so that fee is to help cover that cost. It does not cover the whole cost. Um, us as an agency make up the difference um, afterwards, but that's just to help cover some of that cost so that you guys know where that money is going and why it is reoccurring every time you apply. Um, so I did mention uh, qualifying license is uh, is required, it's the same as the primary draw. If you applied for the primary draw, you already have that covered. Um, there is no preference points at play uh, during the secondary draw. So it doesn't matter how many preference points you have, um, how many you wanna use or don't use or anything like that. They, they 
aren't considered and they don't participate in this. So you don't have to worry about preference points. And there's also no group hunts. I know that's a question that was coming up a lot in the Q and A. Um, there is no group hunts. You cannot apply as a group. This is all done individually. Um, you can kind of look at the stats, which aren't going to help you a ton um, this year. Just something to consider since this is the first year we're doing this. Uh, it's going to change what the stats look like as far as tags going to leftover or getting gobbled up in the secondary draw. So it's really hard to tell what's going to still be there and be easy to draw because this wasn't previously available to most people. Another thing to keep in consideration um, with this new system is that youth hunters have 100% preference. And what that means is as an adult, if there is a, a youth that's 12 to 17 that applies for the same thing that you do, they're going to get it first um, until those tags are out um, or there's no more youth that applied, then it'll start going to adults. And that's trying to get more youth out in the field and get tags in their hands um, so that they can have these great experiences. So if you're a parent and you have a youth or a child or a grandkid or a nephew or whatever that wants to go hunting, um, this is going to be a great way to, you know, really secure hopefully getting them a tag. Um, another thing that's different uh, this year from the, the leftover draw that we used to have is it used to just be for deer and elk. Now it's going to be deer, elk, bear, and pronghorn. So all four of these species are available. Um, again, this application starts tomorrow uh, that you can apply for these and it runs through July 7th. So you have just over a month to fill out your application for the secondary draw. So you have plenty of time if you didn't get what you were looking for in the primary draw this week, uh, do some research, look at different areas, find a new place that you want to hunt, um, and, and take your time figuring out what you want to apply for here and what, what may work out for you. Um, the first link I'm going to bring up right here is this, uh, just this one page um, of how to run this and, and to highlight points. Again, it's a lot of things that I already mentioned, but just to, for your reference to come back to later on, uh, what you're looking for um, and how, how to function this uh, to apply for the secondary draw. But again, most of that information that I just gave you as far as who it's open to, as far as everyone, the uh, fees and preference points not applying, all that's on this page as well. And then if we go back, um, already this was, uh, I didn't expect this to happen till tomorrow, but you can click on any of these links for the species. This is gonna show you what hunt codes are available during the secondary draw. Uh, so they're the same hunt codes that are found in the big game brochure, but these hunt codes are the ones that not enough people applied for them as what was available in the quota. Now, if you're applying for this and you already drew a tag in the primary draw, keep in mind um, the list A, list B, and list C rules. You can still only have one list A tag per species for the year. So if you drew a list A tag, you, you cannot get another tag in the secondary draw that's list A, but you could get a list B or as many list C tags um, as you can get your hands on. So um, kind of watch out for that, but uh, it's a great opportunity if you drew a list A tag, a bull tag or a buck tag in your area, you can look through the hunt codes. Um, you can reference your brochure because these are the same codes that are in your brochure. It makes it a little easier to look at and just see what's still available. If you drew an either sex archery tag, there may be a doe tag that's a list B tag that's available, or you know, like a whitetail only tag out here on the Eastern Plains that's available for archery that you could get another tag for that same species that you're hunting uh, during the secondary draw. So just click on the species, that'll bring up this list of what tags are available um, through this secondary draw. I'm going to give me just a second here, pull my notes back up. Make sure there wasn't anything else I wanted to cover here. Um, uh, so I guess, um, yeah, so a couple things to, to consider. Um, there's not stats for this secondary draw yet because it's the first year we've done it. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like. None of us really do know what it's going to look like coming out of this, but a couple things that I would um, take into consideration is with so many more people able to apply for the secondary draw than previously that leftover list that comes out in August is probably going to be um, substantially smaller so if you traditionally um, use the leftover list uh, and leftover day as a backup plan to get a tag for the year I highly recommend you apply for the secondary draw because what you normally see in the leftover list may not be there 
uh, and again, just reemphasizing the youth and the youth opportunities um, that are available. You can look at those um, on pages, I believe it's 17 through 19. Um, there's expanded youth opportunities uh, described in the big game brochure. Um, look at those. If you're looking to get a kid a tag, um, look at those extra opportunities that are available there and if any of those coincide with the tags that are left on that secondary list. Uh, and I believe that's all I have. If anybody has anything else to touch on there, I think that covers most of that. Anybody else or do we get to go to a poll, the third and last poll? All right, I'm gonna do the poll and after the poll, we're gonna have Andre up. Um, so the last poll, I wanna know how you learned to hunt. How did you learn to hunt? Um, maybe you're brand new to big game hunting. You haven't learned everything you need yet. Books and online, mentored by a friend, mentored by family, taught yourself like Courtney or a CPW hunter outreach or novice program. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna tell you another hunting joke. All right. So a deer hunter was out bragging about the biggest, baddest, handsomest, heaviest deer he'd bagged the day before. He said, it's got enough meat to eat for the whole year, he boasted. Just then, the district wildlife manager came up and cited the man for $500 for hunting without the proper tag. $500, exclaimed the hunter, all that for a mangy, little, scrawny, stuffy, half pint deer? I need to check in and see if Logan's laughing. He's not. Oh, he is laughing. All right. So we're going to end that poll. <laughs> I share the results. All right. So a lot of you learned from a family member. That's really cool. Um, and books and online, um, a friend. Those are the, the friend and family members. I'm really impressed by those of you who taught yourselves. That's awesome, kudos. And if, if you guys need um, a hunter outreach program or a novice program, again, we're gonna talk all about that stuff next week. And we can be your friends to go hunting with. All right, next up we have Andre, who is going to give a brief overview of how leftover day works. So um, Andre, take it away. All right, so we talked about the first draw and then we talked about the second draw. So all the tags that are limited in number, the limited licenses, they're all in one big pile for that first draw. And everything that doesn't get drawn in that first draw goes to the second draw. And if there's anything left after that, there's always something left. <laughs> so everything that's left after that goes to what we call leftover. They're still limited in number, so there's still a quota. So as soon as X number are sold, there are no more. Um, however, this goes on, these licenses, these limited leftover licenses go on sale uh, August 4th this year uh, at 9 a.m. And this is first come, first serve. Uh, we have improved this system recently. This used to be the Wild West when this leftover day would come. People would camp out at our offices because we were the only place you could get them. Uh, we have a much better system now. Uh, you can get those leftover licenses in person at a CPW office. You can get them at a Cabela's, a Walmart, any place that sells licenses. You can get them over the phone and you can get them online. And it all happens at the exact same time at 9 a.m. on August 4th. They all go up at the same time, first come, first serve. So if there's a license with only one left, there's one lucky person and a whole bunch of disappointed people. Uh, so you got to be quick. Sometimes there's licenses where there's a hundred of them left and you don't have to worry so much, but sometimes there's one or two left and you got to be the first one there. That's, that's how it works. First come, first serve. And all those same uh, regulations still apply, uh, except there's no qualifying license for leftover. You can just get a leftover license. And uh, the, the list A, B, and C rules and regulations, those still apply. So this is your chance to start tacking on C's if you want. If you got an A in the first uh, draw, a B in the second draw, and now you want to add on some, some C's, uh, there's usually some C's left in the, the leftover pile. Um, so that's essentially leftover day. I just want to reiterate that you don't have to go to a CPW office. You can, uh, I've, last year we had a whole bunch of people standing in line at the 6060 Broadway office waiting. And a lot of people were just, waiting in line, but on their phones, and they bought the license on their phone faster than being there in person. So 
technology is great. You don't have to camp out. Uh, you can do it from the comfort of your home. You don't have to fight a crowd. Uh, so use the online system if you can, uh, you, but you're still welcome to come in and see us in person if you want. Uh, so that's the leftover. Um, while we're here, if, if uh, there is a question here that I didn't cover. Um, and since Danielle is here and she lives and breathes the uh, <laughs> licensing and the draw every single day, if Danielle's there, there's a question about weighted preference points. And uh, Danielle, if you're on, could you dive in uh, quickly into what weighted preference points are and how they work? Can you guys see and hear me? Yes. All right. So for weighted preference points, we have weighted preference points for moose, sheep, and goat. And basically you have to have a certain number of normal preference points before you can even enter the draw. And then after you reach that baseline of points, you get a weighted point um, for every year you apply after that. And so the weighted preference point draw is really super confusing to explain technically. So I'll give you my easiest explanation. It's not 100% the way it works, but it's more like um, names in a hat approach. So if you have two weighted preference points, your name gets put into the hat two times. And again, this is mathematically not exactly how it works, but it's pretty much the easiest way I can explain it to kind of the general public. Thank you. All yeah. right, thanks. Uh, anything else, Andre? You good? Uh, I'm well. Actually, one just popped up that uh, Danielle might know. I don't know the answer to this. Um, I know in, in the, there's been some questions about resident, non-resident, and there's a percentage that goes into how many resident tags are allocated in the first draw versus non-resident and youth and things like that. Um, can you t can Danielle can you talk a little bit about that and also will that be a part of the secondary draw or is the secondary draw everybody's on the same playing field doesn't matter if you're resident non-resident or youth before daniel tax ta tackles that can i say something about the weighted points please do lisa sure. um the weighted points i want everyone to know understand that it you have a better you have a chance one more chance in the hat if you have three four or five but all those weighted points doesn't mean um, it's not like the preference point. So you can have three weighted points and draw a moose tag and somebody else has 30 weighted points and did not. So I want people to understand, I have a friend just now, their daughter drew with two weighted points, a moose tag, and I have, I'm one of those people that has 30 and I have not. So I just want people to understand the difference between weighted points that you can still draw without having a max points. It's just about your odds are better with more in the hat. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, as far as we call it residency allocation, so the majority of our licenses have 65% that go to residents and then 35% that are allocated to non-residents. Some of our higher preference point threshold licenses for like our moose, sheep and goat um, have an 80-20 split. So 80 go to residents and 20 go to non-residents. Um, I believe those percentages still apply in the secondary draw, but let me double check on that and I will put something in the chat um, to confirm that for everyone. Um, the other thing that I wanted to address that I'm getting a lot of questions about returned licenses. And if someone returns a license that they drew in the primary draw, whether it will be available in the secondary draw. Technically, by regulation, that is allowed. However, this year we have such a tight turnaround with posting of licenses this week and the secondary draw application period opening up tomorrow that we just don't have time to get those licenses in folks' hands so that they can return them and then us get those um, put back into the hunt code list for the secondary draw. So the first time those return licenses will be available for purchases on our leftover day which is August 4th at 9 a.m. this year. All righty, anything else to add from any of the panelists? 
Moving on. All right, Courtney is up next. Courtney is going to be talking about reissue licenses, um, licenses that are turned back in. She's going to talk a little bit more about that and over-the-counter unlimited licenses and OCT, OTC tags. So Courtney, take it away. Hello. Um, so just like everybody else here, I am getting used to this new second draw system and the reissue license system and the over the counter. Um, I definitely have utilized all of them. Um, so I moved to Colorado about four years ago and um, moved here on January 1st. And when it came time for the draw that first year, I was not a resident yet. So that first year, I actually just utilized um, the over-the-counter licenses. Um, I went out for um, an archery elk hunt, got a great over-the-counter license, um, saw elk, and had a blast. And so definitely, if you didn't draw in the first draw, do not be upset. There's a lot of amazing tags that are still available. Um, so the reissue license, now that we have the secondary draw in place, is really just those licenses, the limited licenses that people are choosing to return. So why do people choose to return tags? So a whole bunch of reasons, right? Something you have um, family issues that came up. Um, I had a friend of mine who broke their leg and decided maybe this wasn't the year to, uh, to go on a big 10 day uh, fountain hunt. Um, any of the reasons why someone might choose to return a license. So um, starting on August 11th is when those reissued licenses are going to be available. So they're all going to be posted. Um, it does not require a qualifying license. Um, so that's for residents and non-residents. Um, and so they're going to be posted randomly Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. until the end of the season. So pretty much as soon as someone returns that license, um, as quickly as possible, CPW is going to put it back into the system, back onto that website um, and make it available. So you definitely want to be checking um, every so often on that website. If you're at work, take a little 15 minute break, once a day, twice a day, just click and, uh, and see what's there. So you never know what people are going to return. Um, there's been some absolutely crazy tags that have been returned. Um, so just keep checking it routinely. So the list A, B, and C rules still apply. So if you got an A license in the first draw or the second draw, you can't pick up one of these um, A licenses in the reissue licenses, um, but you can still get, you know, your two B tags or um, the C tags. So um, let me see questions coming in. Um, so that's pretty much it for the reissue licenses. Now that we have the secondary draw, that really is just going to be August 11th, put it on your calendar. And as people are returning licenses, those are going to be going in. So I think if those licenses aren't going to be included in the secondary draw, there's probably going to be a decent amount of them um, that are going to be up on August 11th. Um, also, of course, with the situation with COVID-19 going on, there perhaps could be a lot of people who have decided to turn in their tags. So definitely August 11th, put it on your calendar. Um, so that's about it for the reissue re licenses. Um, Over-the-counter licenses. So these OTC licenses, um, so unlike the limited licenses, these have no quotas. So these are GMUs that allow an unlimited number of um, whatever species you're applying for to be harvested. Um, so it is going to, sorry, it does not require a qualifying license. The list A, B, and C rules still apply. Um, so pretty much what these are is that you can, you can walk into any place that uh, sells these licenses. So like I said, my first year hunting, um, I went in right before archery season opened. I went to the Bass Pro that's not in the street for me, um, where I teach at. And I said, I want an OTC license um, for elk, and they sold it to me. Um, so that works the same for residents and non-residents. 
Um, I have a high school friend of mine who lives out of state who bow hunts with me. And I pick him up from the airport. We go to Bass Pro and he purchases his license um, on our way up to the field. Um, sorry. So um, if you look at um, some of these OTC licenses, you really want to pay attention to the units that they're in and specifically for the species. So if you look for deer, um, there might be some OTC whitetail only tags. So whitetails are in a pretty low density um, in Colorado. They're mainly found east of I-25. Um, and a lot of these are on private property um, for the GMUs open to this license. So you really just wanna make sure that you're understanding um, where you can hunt with an over-the-counter license. Um, did I get my animal with my OTC tag? I did not. Um, my hunting partner did. Um, he happened to be in the right place at the right time. So um, I did not. But uh, where I hunt is a place that uh, Lisa's also hunted and our other hunting buddy have. And um, both of them, uh, I don't know if Lisa has, um, but both my friend and my other buddy have harvested. So there are lots and lots of opportunities in these OTC units. Um, so elk are the most common OTC license that you can get. Um, and so there's a lot of hunters that are available to these. So a lot of these units, they're gigantic, gigantic units. Um, there's lots of property, lots of terrain, lots of um, topo changes, steep inclines. So if, you, uh, if you're ready for a hike, definitely look at what's available. Um, so if you look at your GMU maps, um, pretty much for archery OTC options um, for elk, um, and then for second or third rifle antlered bull, um, and then you just really have to pay attention to the list A and list B options. So um, for pronghorn, um, you can look at the OTC options for archery. Um, I don't believe that there are any OTC options for mule deer. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then for bear, um, there's over-the-counter licenses for bear as well. So if you're interested in picking up any of those, um, be sure to look at that section. So um, it's pretty much starting on page 33, um, looking for deer and then into elk, you can see all the different GMU maps for OTC. So OTC tags are definitely um, obviously a great choice if you didn't draw anything the first draw or the second draw, didn't see anything that you wanted in the, um, in the leftover list. Um, but it's also a great option like um, I do for hunting with out-of-state hunters. So you don't have to worry about um, will I get a tag, will I draw a tag, will I not, when do we know if we can go. We go every year. So we get this OTC tag every single year and we hunt the same, same dates, pretty much same unit. Um, it's also great if you are mentoring a new hunter um, that you can be able to you know, say to them, okay, you wanna hunt? Great, you wanna um, archery hunt for elk? Grab this tag and, and you can go out. So um, it's a little bit easier because not always for mentoring, um, it always seems to be people reaching out to you within the season saying, hey, you know, um, could, you, could you show me around this weekend? Could you take me out? So um, it's definitely a great option for um, later in the season. So um, that's about all I've got. Thanks. Let's go back to Brian for a wrap up. I mean, I think that's the fastest we've ever done one of these webinars, folks, right? Um, Brian, do you want to talk about, um, just to give a little wrap up for those of you um, who want more information to follow up, I actually put some resources in the comments. There is a link to the big game brochure there. There is the phone number for hunt planners. And I also put a link for the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Hunter Outreach page. That's uh, Brian's whole department there. So, well, and other people, there's other people there too, but um, y'all know Brian from this series by, what, pretty well by now. Um, so, uh, check out that chat box and uh, Brian, let's wrap it up. Oh, can I tell one more joke? Yes. Okay, hold on. Let me see what it is. 
Um, what is a waterfowl hunter's favorite game? Duck, duck, goose. <laughs> can you unmute right. so I can hear you all laughing? That's a good no? one. But, okay. That's all right, that's Brian, back to you. Also, Brian, before you um, wrap things up, I did want to post a correction on the allocation for secondary draw. There is no allocation percentages for secondary draw. So resident, non-resident, everyone has equal opportunity. So thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. I, uh, That's why we, we got you here, Danielle. Thanks for coming with a save. We really appreciate it. It's new you. with me, for me too, so. <laughs> All right. So great to have someone from licensing here. Thanks again. Yep. All right, Brian. Okay. So if, if you haven't figured it out already, um, everyone that's still on, um, the big game licenses, you know, it, it's a game to play. It's, it, it's a process to learn from the primary draw, the secondary draw. How do you look at the leftover licenses? Checking in on those reissue license from time to time and falling back to the over-the-counter options that are available. Playing the list A and list B, and if you can get your list C tags, those are, that's the way that you play the game and think about how, how you want to plan that out short term. You, I mean, anyone can get an over the counter elk license this year, right? There's opportunities for that, but start playing the game and start planning future years of hunting, right? So maybe this year you're just doing over the counter, but in a couple of years you can get a really nice limited license tag. So, so kind of um, play the game a little bit. Hopefully, um, these seminars are helping. Um, hopefully some of the answers we're, we're providing in the, in the Q&A section are helpful as well. So thank you for tuning in. Next week, we are going to talk about um, a hunting community. So we'll have some thoughts on, you know, if you're looking to, to find some other people to hunt with, what are some ways to get involved? So I think that's all I have. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Anyone, any other panelists have anything to say? Right. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. I look forward to next week where I'm actually going to do one of the sections. So thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all. Have an awesome night and see you next week. <laughs>